All right, all right, cool. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Holland Park Ecology Centre and Libraries talk on bees in the city and introduction to urban pollinators. I'm very excited to be joined by Professor Jeff Odenton this evening, and he'll be talking for about 45 minutes. There'll be plenty of opportunity for questions at the end. Um, that slide to start with is a housekeeping slide, which says uh, about housekeeping, if you need captions, and a recording will be available of this talk afterwards. And importantly, it also says it's part of our Bee Super Highway initiative, which is a borough wide project this summer to encourage more pollinating hotspots, which leads very nicely for me to introduce Jeff to talk more about the role of urban pollinators in London. Jeff, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Trevor. It's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. Um, yes, yeah, so today we're going to be focusing on bees in cities. I want to give a, um, a bit of an introduction to the idea of, of urban pollinators. Um, before I do that, I'll just introduce myself very, very briefly, just to say a little bit about who I am and, and uh, how I come to be talking with you tonight about, about urban bees and other pollinators. So I'm currently um, visiting Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Northampton. I was um, a full professor there up until last year. I stepped down from that professorship um, in October uh, to go uh, sort of freelance as, a, as an independent consultant scientist and, and author, uh, but continuing to sort of focus on, on conservation of pollinators. Um, I've also got a visiting professorship in China at the Kunming Institute of Botany. Um, I've been studying pollinators for something over 30 years now. I started my PhD back in 1989, uh, finished in 93, that was at, at Oxford Brooks. Um, and the field work that I've done sort of subsequent to that um, has taken me all over the world. I've been incredibly fortunate in, in that respect. Uh, and I've done field work across Africa and South America and Australia, quite a bit in the Canary Islands, particularly on Tenerife uh, and, and in the UK as well. Um, I've written something around 125 uh, research papers, book chapters, and so on. Also written for um, magazines like British Wildlife and, and New Scientist. Um, and as well as the academic side of my work, I've always been interested in working with practitioners, with local authorities, with consultancies and, and so on. Uh, and so I'm a member of the, the Northamptonshire Local Nature Partnership and I've worked with the Wildlife Trust up, up there as well. Um, I am not a beekeeper. Um, it might be something I do in my retirement, but at the moment I'm not a beekeeper. So if you've got questions about beekeeping, I'm not the best person to uh, to ask. I know a bit about bees, and I'll, I'll talk about honeybees a little bit towards the end, um, but I'm not a beekeeper. Um, that's a link to my website there. I have a regular blog there, which I, I post uh, interesting articles and information up um, several times a, a month. Um, and my latest book came out in January this year, um, published by Pelagic Publishing, uh, and it's called uh, Pollinators and Pollination, Nature and Society, um, available from all good booksellers or directly from publishers. Um, so let's dive right in then and think about the wider context of, of what we're talking about here. Although we're, we're going to focus specifically on pollinators, really what we're talking about is bio, biodiversity. And I'd like you to think about what biodiversity means to, to you. When, you. when you hear this word biodiversity, do you think about towns and cities in Britain? Or do you think about the biodiversity of the Amazon rainforest or things that are happening in Southeast Asia and the idea of saving the, the, the whole planet, it's in your hands, but the hands are holding on to jaguars and, and uh, parrots and um, tropical rainforest there. Um, but biodiversity is all, is all around us. If you, if you think about the, the formal definition of biodiversity, the variety of life in all its forms and at all levels, going all the way from, from genes and genetic diversity, all the way through species up to, to ecosystems, um, biodiversity is everywhere. It's, it's across the planet. Um, and there is a lot of biodiversity 
in our towns and cities. Um, so a couple of these photographs are taken around Northampton. The one on the bottom right is in is in London, actually, uh, where some local residents are creating a wild flower meadow um, around their around their flats. And the more we look at our towns and cities, our urban environments, the more that uh, we can see that biodiversity is 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 there if we take notice of it. And I think that's one of, been one of the interesting things about lockdown actually, is the way in which people have really started to notice the birds and the plants and the bees and butterflies and so on uh, that were around in their gardens and their parks and, um, and so on. And perhaps we'll come back to that a, a little bit later. Um, but quite often urbanization is seen as a threat to biodiversity. Um, and I often see uh, you know statements such as this in in research papers that I read that uh, you know the growth of urban areas when the, since the second half of the 20th century um, is considered a main driver of land use changes and hence a major threat to biodiversity worldwide. Um, and there's some interesting projections from the United Nations about uh, the proportion of the world's population which are going to be living in towns and cities in uh, by the end of this this century we could be up to 80 or 90 90 percent uh, so urbanization is seen as a big threat to to biodiversity um, and it's it's certainly true that more people are moving to towns and cities as i as i said that is increasing and that our urban areas are expanding as well um, but it's worth remembering that only one to two percent of the habitable planet is currently urban. So if we take out the the, the deserts such as the Sahara, the Sahara, um, the Antarctic, and and the Arctic um, out of the equation, the actual habitable area of the planet only one or two percent is actually urbanised. In contrast, forty percent is used for food production. Now. That forty percent of the food production clearly is feeding the the one or two percent, which is which is urbanised. But nonetheless, if we just think of it in terms of the amount of area which is is being affected, uh, the land areas that's been affected by urbanisation, it's clearly clearly a much smaller fraction of the of the the planet compared to what's being used for, directly for food production. Um, even in a very, very urbanised country, such as the UK, we consider it ourselves to be quite urbanised. Uh, somewhere between five and 10% is, is urban. Um, there is a lack of agreement about what exactly constitutes urban and what constitutes rural and agricultural and, and so on. But the, the consensus is that, you know, somewhere between five and 10% is urban, of which about two and a half percent is is green urban. Uh, you know, parks, cemeteries, and and so forth. And that's, you know, when I, I go to, well, I, up until this year, or last year, uh, I used to go to London very regularly. Uh, and I was always struck by how green the, the city was, the number of parks and, and squares and, and open areas and, and so on. Um, so probably less than 10% of Britain is, is urban. 70 percent is is agricultural so again if we're thinking about biodiversity thinking about threats to biodiversity i think that i would argue that um urbanization is not always the problem uh it might it, it's problems about loss of habitat for example um uh, are much more uh an issue around agricultural landscapes than urban landscapes <coughs> Excuse me. So we need to, I think, ask this question: Does urbanisation always have a, a negative effect on on biodiversity? Um, so we move from Trump Tower, uh, as you can see there in Chicago. Uh, we move directly on to a picture that was actually taken in my back garden in, in Northampton. Uh, and we'll think about pollinators, and we'll focus from now on specifically on on pollinators, having set that that wider perspective. Um, so what are pollinators? Um, Pollinators are animals which are facilitators of, of plant reproduction. Uh, and by animals, I'm including insects within, within that, but of course, um, some birds act as pollinators, particularly in the tropics and the subtropics. 
bats as well, lizards. There's a there's a wide range of different types of pollinators, uh, but the majority of them are are insects. Um, and they facilitate plant reproduction because, unlike most animals, plants can't move around to find mates. So they have to recruit help. They have to uh, recruit what we term a pollen vector. Now, um, for the majority of uh, flowering plants worldwide, uh, probably about 90% of them, uh, and I think there are 352,000 species of flowering plants approximately worldwide, uh, about 90% of them use insects and birds and bats and so on as uh, as their pollen vectors. Um, in the UK, that, that figure is about 70% of our native plant species. Um, we think we've got about 1,500 native plants. Uh, most of the rest then are wind pollinated. If any of you are uh, uh, suffer from hay fever, uh, it's the wind pollinated plants which are causing your, 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 the, the problem. Uh, there are some water pollinated plants as well, so plants which are um, aquatic um, or which shed their pollen into the, into the water and the water currents move the, the pollen around. Um, so that's what we mean by a pollinator, a facilitator of, of plant reproduction. Um, and often when we think about pollinators, we think about honeybees or just bees generally. They're the, the, the best known of our pollinators. Uh, but actually in Britain, we've got a, um, a surprising diversity of pollinators. Uh, about 270 species of, of bees. Um, you know, in, in all cases, I'm saying approximately here because uh, we know that some species of bees have gone extinct. Um, we know that we've had new species of bees arrive in the last uh, decade or two. Um, so these are always going to be approximate numbers. Uh, but about 270 species of bees, uh, that compares to about 20,000 worldwide. Uh, more than 270 species of hoverflies, uh, about 60 species of butterflies. Not all butterflies um, visit flowers by any means. Some just feed on, on sap and honeydew uh, on leaves and, and fruit as well, uh, but most of them are, are flower uh, feeders. Uh, and then about 800 species of larger moths um, that act as pollinators. Um, again, not all of those moths visit uh, flowers as, as adults. But then most of the diversity of pollinators is actually made up of other types of flies, uh, beetles, wasps, sawflies, and, and so on, hundreds and hundreds of different species of those. And um, the entomologist Stephen Falk, uh, who wrote um, Field Guide to the, to the Bees of Britain and, and Ireland a few years ago, he's calculated that perhaps as many as 6,000 British insect species visit flowers. Uh, and can act as, as pollinators. Uh, so a huge diversity of, uh, of pollinators, um, even in a, a country like Britain, a relatively small island. So why does that diversity matter? Why is it important? Uh, well, it matters for a number of reasons, I think. One is that uh, we know that some wild plants are adapted to being pollinated by particular types of pollinators. So Often a, a, a bee pollinated plant um, <coughs> can't be pollinated by a fly uh, or a butterfly pollinated plant can't be pollinated by, by a bee. So if we lose the pollinators, we lose the plants uh, as well. Uh, we know that crop pollination is more effective if you have more species involved. You get this sort of competitive effect between the insects where they're, they're forcing each other to move around between uh, between between flowers. Um, and in fact, in this country, pr probably at most 30% <coughs> excuse me, um, of, of our um, crop pollination is done by, by honeybees. So something catching my throat here. Um, in fact, relying on honeybees for crop pollination is, is a really risky strategy. We know that there are um, disease issues, varroa, various viral diseases as well associated with uh, with honeybees. So just relying on those, even if we could, even if we could get enough honeybee hives, 
which is something I'll come back to. Um, it's a risky strategy. Uh, but the final thing is, though, it, it, biodiversity and conservation of biodiversity is part of our heritage, and it's part of the heritage that we're leaving behind for our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, future generations. Um, and as I'll show you in a moment, there are uh, pollinators that were common uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, which are now very, very uncommon in, in Britain. And so we're changing, uh, by our actions, we're changing the heritage that we're leaving behind for, for future generations. Um, on a, a more kind of prosaic level, I, I, I guess there is a, an economic value to, to biodiversity, to, excuse me, biodiversity. Uh, the Dasgupta Review, which the government commissioned uh, last year and, and, and which was published earlier this year um, on the economics of biodiversity, uh, sets out a very, very strong case for how uh, biodiversity underpins uh, the economy of this country in, in multiple different different ways. Uh, and that's available online if you just Google uh, the Dasgupta Review, we can download a, a PDF of, of that. Um, and in there, you'll see some figures about the, the contribution of pollinators to uh, crop pollination, um, somewhere between 510 and 690 million pounds per, per year uh, is what they add to our agricultural production, which sounds like a lot of money. Actually, it's only about 10% of, of agricultural output um, and perhaps uh, 0.3 of a percent of our gross domestic product, our, our GDP. So in, in absolute terms there, it's not a, not a huge amount. Uh, but I really like this quote from, from the Desktop to Review. This is a direct quote that um, pollinators may, may be of great value even if they're measurable services, that is in, in terms of money. Uh, measurable services to GDP are of negligible worth. Uh, and there's a lot of things to unpack within there, but one of the things uh, is the um, uh, the example of of the the contribution of pollinators to um, to soil carbon, to the way in which carbon is locked up in the soil, and and how that then uh, helps us with combating uh, global warming and climate change. Uh, and if you Google that, um, that, the title of that article there, pollinators are a secret weapon in the fight against global global warming. <coughs> um, that was something that I, I published um, early, uh, earlier in March, in mid-March, mid and it's freely available. You can, you can have a look at that and see, see the argument there. Um, so pollinators are really important. Diversity of pollinators are, is important, but wild pollinator diversity in the UK is, is changing. I'm not going to go into this in, in depth, but it's, it's one of the ways in which um, government and conservationists um, track changes in diversity um, of, bio, of pollinators and other elements of biodiversity over, over time. Uh, and certainly for bees since you know, the early 2000s, we've seen a drop in diversity. Uh, from the mid 90s onwards, we've seen a drop in diversity of, of, uh, of hoverflies. Um, and much more recently, uh, the charity Butterfly Conservation has published this um, State of Britain's Larger Moths report. Uh, again, freely available if you if you Google it on, online, um, with with some really frightening evidence as to how much our moths have declined in in this country. They're estimating a 33% decline in moths in Britain between the late 60s and uh, 2017 is the most latest the the latest data. Um, and hidden within that statistic are some really sad stories of things like the, the, the moth that I'm showing there, the lappet moth, uh, which has had a 98% decrease in its abundance since the late 1960s. Uh, and there are lots of other examples like that, the common garden tiger moth, for, for example. So um, really, you know, quite worrying statistics. Now, the reason for this, uh, for these losses, is uh, is complex. There's lots of different factors there. Loss of habitat is the main thing. Wildflower meadows, um, 
we probably lost over 90% of our wild flower meadows, other kinds of species rich grassland as well. And it's mainly been for agriculture. As I say, 70% of, of Britain is agricultural. Yes, we've lost some for, for urbanization, but as a proportion of, of the land in, in Britain, it's been a relatively um, small, small fraction. Um, there are other factors. Poor management of, of woodland, for example, is, is one factor. Um, the intensification of farming throughout the 20th and into the 21st century, use so of pesticides and herbicides and, and so on, um, all, all playing a role. Uh, and more recently, in the last decade or two, climate change we know is really starting to have, have an impact. So I want us to then to focus on towns and cities in, in Britain. Um, and to focus on the town, my adopted hometown, uh, which is Northampton, uh, where I've lived since uh, 1995. Um, and I want to present two pollinator case studies. Uh, one is looking at diversity and abundance of urban bees right in the center of, uh, of Northampton, the most urbanized part of it. Uh, and the other one is looking at the edge of Northampton and, and the effect of the construction of a whole new university campus from my, my, my former employer and how that's affected bee and, and plant diversity on, on the campus. Um, just to locate you geographically, um, Northampton is pretty close to the centre of, of England. Um, it's about an hour north of, of London. Um, just north of, of Milton Keynes, similar sort of size to Milton Keynes, about 230,000 people. Uh, if you contrast that to London, 8.1 million, uh, or Manchester, 2.6, uh, it's right, it's much smaller. Um, similar in size actually to my hometown, Sunderland, up in the northeast, that's where I'm, I'm from originally. Um, so it, it's a, a medium to, to, to large town um, in Britain, it's, it's not a super metropolis by by any means. But like a lot of towns in Britain, um, there is an active building uh, program happening, uh, particularly around the periphery of the, the town. And this is a map from uh, Northampton Borough Council um, showing in um, uh, sort of a, a yellowish colour there where the proposed developments are on the on the outskirts of town. Um, and as you can see, there's the, the quite a lot in the, in the north and, and in the west and in the, in the south in, in particular. Um, so the town is increasing in size, as, as so many uh, towns and cities are in, in Britain. So let's let's focus on this this first case study, then uh, the the um, urban bees in the, in the centre of uh, of Northampton. Uh, and this was a PhD project by a um, former PhD student of mine, Dr. Musafat Hussain Sirohi, uh, who's from uh, the Shah Abdul Latif University in Pakistan. <coughs> and uh, that university funded, funded the work, actually. Um, and what Musafat did was to focus on what we term the solitary and primitively eusocial bees uh, in, in Britain. So most bees... Uh, globally, and most bees in Britain are not social. They don't have um, a social structure with the queen and, and workers and, and so on. Uh, so um, honeybees are social, bumblebees are social as well, uh, but most of the rest are either solitary or they're what we term primitively eusocial. They have a, a primitive um, uh, social structure. And those were the bees that he focused on because they tend to be smaller than uh, the bumblebees, for example. Um, and the bumblebees can often fly into towns and cities from, from far outside those, uh, the, the urban environment. Um, and we really wanted to focus on those bees that we knew were living and nesting within the, the urban environment. Uh, and what Mustafa did over a couple of field seasons is to um, survey road verges and stone walls and grassland and uh, so around the electricity substations and churchyards and, and so on and, and captured bees and identified them. Uh, and he compared them with nearby nature reserves outside of the, um, of the town. 
Uh, and you can see uh, on this uh, this diagram here, this is the, the centre of Northampton. If you know Northampton at all, uh, All Saints Church is in the middle, and this is a 500 metre radius out there. So it's right in the centre of, um, of town. Uh, we published that work back in um, 2013, I think it was. If anybody wants any copies of, um, of any of the papers or studies that I'm talking about here, uh, just send me a message via my website and I'll happily share it with you. Um, so so we, he surveyed the bees here and then compared them to these nature reserves around uh, the edge of, of Northampton. And these are the, this is Musa Far here uh, on the top right, um, uh, doing a survey in the, in the middle of town. And these are the sorts of areas that he was he was surveying. Uh, this, this is outside the old uh, bus station here. Um, this, if you can tell what it is, it's it's the the, the keyhole for a um, a lamppost, uh, and it's uh, a bee which is actually nesting in there at the, at the moment. Um, one of his techniques for um, surveying was what is what is termed pan trapping where we put out these colored pans uh in the in in a uh, in a site and filled with water and we we catch the the bees as they as they fly in and, and identify them uh and this is what the main sort of north south dual carriageway right down the the uh the center of town um and he was fight catching bees along um along this vegetation here. There didn't seem to be any effect of the, uh, of the roads as acting as a, as a barrier. Uh, and he was, he was looking at sort of formal gardens such as um, this churchyard here, um, but also very scrubby bits of, of grassland here or, or weed land, if, if you like, areas where uh, they, the, the local contractors hadn't sprayed glyphosate uh, and which have a surprising diversity of plants in them. Actually, I think you know this is one of the things I would recommend to um, uh, to to, uh, to towns and cities is to not spray these sorts of areas with uh, with weed killer uh, because yeah, they, there's a surprising diversity of plants in here and a surprising diversity of pollinators as, as we'll see. But he's looking at old stone walls as well. And, you know, an area like this where there's loose lime mortar, where uh, bees can uh, can nest. Uh, we know there were bees nesting in these small holes here. And they were using this little little patch of, uh, of, of weeds. Um, they can live most of their life cycle in a, in a small area, just a few meters across, uh, particularly some of, the, some of the, 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 the very small bees. So what did we find in this study? Well, here are just an overview of the highlights. Um, we so far found um, about 45 species of um, urban solitary bees, just in that 500 meter radius um, circle. Um, if we know that there were social bumblebees there, we know there were honeybees as, as well. So it's probably at least 60 species there if we include those as well. Um, they've got a range of nesting strategies, most of them are soil nesting bees, uh, but they were like nesting in old stone walls, uh, cavities of various kinds, I'll show you that lamppost keyhole of, of course. Um, and as I said, roads didn't seem to be a, um, a specific barrier to movement of those, um, those bees. Um, but interestingly, what we found was that the diversity in the town was significantly greater than that in the nature reserves. Um, I think in the nature reserves that we, we found about 40 species of, uh, of bees. All of those bees that were found in the nature reserve were also found in the town. Um, and so it was additional bees that were found uh, in, the, in the urban centre. Um, and one of those that was that was found um, is a really very rare species of uh, of bee in Britain. It's a red data book species, a thing called Celioxis quadridentata, um, which is has been rarely encountered in this in this part of Britain, uh, but we we confirmed it as being present there. Um, since those surveys, which were uh, sort of 2010 through to 20. 12 I think uh, we've added more bees to to the urban list 
um, from surveys that, that I've done, observations that, that I've made, uh, including in my own garden. This was a bee that I found in my garden last year, which I'd never encountered before. Um, it may well have been there in the garden previously, um, but I, I just not spotted it. But I spent quite a lot of time during lockdown over the spring and summer um, studying um, uh, the, the pollinators within the garden because where else were we going to go? Um, and this is a thing called the red girdle mining bee, which again is not a particularly common bee in this in this part of Britain. Um, and um, it's a, a very stunning and a very um, uh, 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 yeah stunning. I, I think stunning is the right word. It's a, it's a stunning bee. Um, beautiful red girdle, as the name as the name suggests. But something to to, to spot here. Uh, is how small that bee is. So these photos are by um, Stephen Fogg. Again, um, my photographs were, were nowhere near as good. So I asked him if I could borrow these. Um, but just look at how small that, that bee is uh, compared to Steve's fingers there. Um, but that's actually fairly typical for bees in, in Britain. Um, honey bees, which you think of as being an average bee, are actually quite large bees in comparison to most of the bees in, uh, in Britain. Um, so our, our list of um, of bees in in uh, urban areas in in uh, in Northampton is is increasing year on on year. We're making new discoveries all the time. So the second case study I want to to just um, focus on is um, relates to uh, my former employer, University of Northampton. As I say, I'm a visiting professor there. Um, and I'm still involved in some of the work that we're that we're doing there. Um, and um, back in 2012, it was proposed that the university relocate to a whole new campus site um, on the edge of town, on the south, the south side of town. This is the River Nin here, running through the south of the town. Um, the area that um, Musafar was surveying as part of his study. Uh, is up in in here, um, and so this is right on the, the edge of town. It was a large brownfield site, um, and um, it's 22 hectares in extent, <coughs> and we're going to build a whole new campus from the from the ground up. Um, and so right from the from the beginning, we got sort of involved in this. We were interested in in you know questions around how this um, purpose built urban campus was going to impact on on local biodiversity, and whether we could um, design elements into the um, into the campus that would increase biodiversity and potentially mitigate the, the negative impacts. Um, and there is a wider context for for this um, uh, for this work, which is broader than just thinking about the the pollinators and, and thinking about the plants. Uh, is that you know if we see Waterstown campus here um, on uh, next to to the river, it's adjacent to quite a large wildlife trust local nature reserve, similar sort of size to to the campus, um, which has has uh, nature reserve status. Um, but it's also within a, a kilometre of the southern end of the Upper Nen Valley Special Protection Area, uh, which is also a Ramsar site. Uh, and the, the United Nations Ramsar designation is for internationally important wetland sites. Um, and this area here of the, uh, of the, the, the Upper Nen Valley uh, going up towards Peterborough um, is internationally important for its overwintering birds in particular. Um, so what the, this wasn't just um, about the pollinators, uh, it was about the, the biodiversity of the site as a, as a whole. We've been doing bird surveys uh, across the site, uh, but I'll focus just on the pollinators and the, and the plants this evening. Um, so right from the beginning, uh, we as academics, uh, talked with the landscape architects who uh, LUC had been recruited to, uh, to do the landscaping on the and design and carry out the landscaping on, on the site um, and with the wildlife trust as well because they had an interest clearly in the site um, and we negotiated just under half of the site by ten and a half hectares um, to be devoted to new habitat creation uh, including planting mature native trees uh, putting in uh, species-rich meadow sites, 
um, some reed beds and also recreating brownfield site because we know that brownfield sites, post-industrial sites, can be incredibly rich in, in pollinators uh, and, and insects generally. Uh, and so we wanted to recreate some of what was, had been on the site originally um, on, the, on the new campus. Uh, so here's just some shots of the um, uh, of the campus during the the, uh, the building phase, uh, the remediation of the site because it was post-industrial, uh, and the construction took place over four years between 2014 and 2018. Uh, people always ask me about the cost of, 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 of this thing. It was over 300 million in in total for the for the new campus, um, uh, of which quite a lot of money went into into the into the landscaping, as you'll, you'll see in, in a moment. Um, so here's some shots of the of the landscaping and of the uh, the site as a um, as a whole. And um, what the landscape architects did was to zone the site. So the center of the site here, the center of the campus, uh, is is formal. There's formal planted borders here, mainly non-native species. Uh, with a large lawn and some some native trees planted and then as you move out uh, further out of the site uh, you have uh, species rich grassland planted here um, you have these uh, suds the sustainable urban drainage systems here um, you've got this recreated brownfield site uh, here uh, it, 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 on, on, the, on the periphery of it uh, and we've been doing a whole set of surveys over, over that time, particularly looking at the birds, but also plants and pollinators, getting um, colleagues and, and students involved in the, in the site as well. And so uh, we weren't able to do any surveys last summer for obvious reasons. Uh, but our first day of, of bee sampling actually took place in May 2019. Uh, and we uh, involved our county bee recorder, who's Ryan Clark. Uh, and our county plant recorder, Brian Lane, uh, just to do an initial assessment of, of what was present on the, on the site. Um, and in that one day of sampling, uh, we found 25 bee species. And um, as you can see, that, that uh, what we term a species accumulation curve is still rising up. So after uh, nine 30 minute sampling periods, uh, we were we were still finding species of bees, so we we know that there's many more than 25 bee species there. Um, I added the 26th in in 2020 actually with a with a quick one-off survey. Uh, eight butterflies and, and day flying moths. Uh, again, I'm sure there are, there are more there. Uh, but interestingly, the plant diversity is is phenomenally high. There, um, 169 plant species. Uh, including one plant, a thing called the small flowered catch fly, which was thought to be extinct in, in the, the county as a whole. It was last recorded in 1843, uh, and we found it on, on, um, on that site. Um, and Brian was the most incredibly excited uh, naturalist you can you can imagine he was just over the moon to to find it there. So we'll we'll continue doing some of, some of those surveys this uh, this spring and summer, and I'm sure that we'll add more more species to the to the site. So um, there's been a growing awareness over the last sort of 15 years, perhaps 20 years or so, of just how important urban areas are for pollinators and for supporting pollinator diversity. Uh, and there's a few studies uh, been published uh, recently. This one got a lot of press uh, by Catherine Baldock and, and colleagues um, looking at the importance of urban areas for flower visiting insects. Uh, I published this with, a, with some colleagues. The city is a refuge for, for insect pollinators. Uh, that was a few years ago. Uh, more recently, I've been working with um, a young PhD student, Kit Prendergast in, uh, in Australia on um, plant pollinator um, interactions in Australian urban bushland remnants. Uh, and that was uh, published earlier this year. We've got another paper just about to come out on, on that project. Um, so there's, there's huge interest in urban pollinators now. Um, and we're beginning to realize just how important urban areas are for, for pollinators. And there's a number of reasons why they're, uh, why they're important. 
Um, first of all, uh, plant diversity in, in gardens is, is much greater than, uh, than in, in sort of nature reserves and wild areas and, and agricultural areas in, in Britain. Um, I mentioned earlier that we've got 1500 species of, um, uh, of native plants in, in the country. It's thought that somewhere between sort of 30 and 60,000 um, non-native species are in cultivation in Britain, in British gardens. Um, and so, so the, the diversity of plants is, is much greater. Um, and the flowering time of those non-native plants is, is much longer as well. Uh, and in towns and, and cities, and, you know, I've seen this in London, I've seen it elsewhere, you can have non-native plants in flower 12 months of the year, um, providing nectar and pollen for, for those pollinators. Um, with climate change, of course, we're also starting to find some of our native plants are flowering longer. Um, and again, in, in uh, towns and cities, because of the warmer, drier microclimate, that's a more benign environment in terms of microclimate. And as I mentioned, there's, you know, there's nesting opportunities, you know, walls and dry soil and so on for, for bees. Um, but a lot of this, this, uh, this work, and you know, some of my own included, um, of, of why towns and cities are important for, for pollinators is framed around this, this notion of conservation of biodiversity by the city. The city is acting to conserve biodiversity. Um, and that's, that's perfectly fine, that's, that's actually perfectly valid. But another way, a, a, a complementary way of looking at this um, is about conservation for the city, we're conserving biodiversity for the city, um, and and this statement, this this notion, conservation for the city, uh, we can trace back to uh, Professor Stuart Pickett, uh, who's an American uh, academic, an American ecologist, uh, works at the, the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, and what he's pointed out, um, and he's absolutely right, is is that by conserving um, biodiversity within our cities, we're also conserving what we term the ecosystem services, the way in which um, species and ecosystems support human society. Um, and there's you know, one example there from, from my garden. Um, uh, this is a, a solitary bee, an Andrina species, pollinating the apple tree uh, in my garden um, a, a couple of years ago. So it's, it's conservation of pollinators because they're um, they're they're pollinating the the fruit and vegetables in in my garden, and um, there's increasing interest in in growing our own uh, fruit and vegetables within gardens or within allotments and and um, green spaces within within towns and cities, um, and globally it's really really important. Uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization uh, estimates that about 800 million people practice urban and, and peri-urban agriculture, uh, accounting for about one-fifth of, of agricultural output um, globally. Um, so it, it's, it's not a small um, contribution to, to food security by, by any means. It's, it's very, very important. Um, uh, this bee fly actually is pollinating cherry also in, in my garden by, by coincidence. Uh, and of course, London, uh, historically, most of the food that was grown uh, for consumption in, in London was done in and around London itself. Uh, and of course, if we're going to um, conserve pollinators for the city, uh, and uh, as well as by the city, uh, we've got to take into account things like management of, of grasslands and road verges and, and so on, and not over managing road verges, you know, allowing plants to, um, to grow, uh, not, not over managing them. Uh, this is the same embankment looked at from two different directions. They, they mowed this to within an inch of its life and kept this, um, this part of it um, diverse and, and rich in, in flowers. Uh, though actually this area here is probably much better for nesting of, of mining bees than, uh, than this area. Um, I particularly like this, this shot. This is platform six 
uh, and Milton Keynes uh, Station uh, and the view opposite. Fantastic um, wild flower meadow that's been created there. Um, so I've, I've, I've made a case of, of pollinators uh, being important for cities and cities being important for pollinators. But I just want to finish by saying that uh, towns and cities are not always benign for our, for our pollinators. Uh, and there's more work by uh, Kath Bolduck who came out in uh, this journal, Current Opinion in Insect Science um, last year, I think it was. Uh, opportunities and threats for pollinator conservation in global towns and, and cities. And I'm not going to go into, the, into this in detail, um, but there are um, some significant threats from the urban environment that need to be managed if, um, uh, if, if pollinators are going to thrive in, in our towns and cities. One of them is competition from increased numbers of honeybee hives. Uh, but, um, so wild pollinators are, are competing with honeybees for uh, for nectar and, and pollen, um, and there is a real concern uh, in some of our larger towns and cities uh, that there are just too many um, uh, beehives being kept there. Um, so numbers of registered hives in London, for example, has more than doubled in less than a decade, um, and this reports. Um, here from Phil Stevenson and, and colleagues suggests that for large parts of central London, um, beekeeping is unsustainable. It just isn't enough. Uh, there aren't enough flowers for them to for those bees to to forage on. Uh, and that figure of um, of doubling in the last decade sort of fits in with this global increase in uh, beehive numbers from from the 1960s. Uh, again, this is data from the FAO. Uh, globally, there's, there's been numbers have almost doubled since since the 1960s, uh, and it's increasing onwards. So, you know, many of our pollinators are in, in trouble, but but honey bees are not one of them. Um, in the UK, this is some figures that I put together for my for my book. Um, I won't again. I won't unpack this in in detail because it's quite a complex story. But since the 1960s uh, uh, to now. Um, honeybee numbers, uh, certainly numbers of hives, have increased or stayed roughly stable since, since that period. Uh, the other thing that Kath uh, focused on within her, um, her threats section to uh, pollinators is chemicals, pesticides, pollution and, and so on. Um, and again, you know, we, we might think of these kinds of road verges as being uh, wonderful places for, uh, for our pollinators to, uh, to exist in towns and cities. Uh, but actually, as, as this recent paper by Ben Phillips and, and colleagues points out, there are multiple pollutants that are coming directly from, um, from the vehicles on, on the roads. Um, which are, uh, can potentially cause problems for, for pollinators. Uh, and that, that's open access. Again, if you Google that, that title, you'll, you'll find it, you'll be able to download it. And they put some recommendations in there for how these sorts, these sorts of areas should be managed. Um, and I think one of the things I would, would, uh, would add to that is that we stop using things like um, pesticides and, and uh, glyphosate, um, herbicides on uh, on these sorts of sites and all too many local councils are, are doing it now. Okay so my very last slide then just to just to summarize um, what's our take-home message from this? Well I, I think the first thing to say is is that you know, hopefully I've demonstrated that towns and cities can be can be home to surprising diversity of wild bees and, and other pollinators. London is no exception um, in, in that respect. Um, a couple of years ago, Kew Gardens produced a report saying that they just recorded their 100th species of, um, of pollinator, a uh, bee, sorry, within, within the garden, and there are many other pollinators there as well. Uh, and yeah, the, the parks and gardens um, throughout London, I know, are, are rich in pollinators. Um, conserving those pollinators, important. You know, for the insects themselves, for all the reasons I pointed out, but also for human society, pollination of food crops, pollination of wild plants as well, and, and the, the ecosystem services that 
those wild plants uh, produce. Um, but we need to be careful how we manage those urban areas. They're not always benign places for, for pollinators. And there's lots that we need to consider there. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. Um, I hope that's been of interest to you. I'm happy to answer any questions that you uh, that you might have. Uh, there's a link to my website there if uh, you want to get in touch or see a little bit more about the kind of work that I do. Uh, and that's my uh, that's my book, which I say came out in, in January uh, this year. So uh, yeah, look forward yes. to hearing your questions. Jeff, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, apologies for the echo, but I think it's just me and we can hear Jeff nice and clearly. Yes, Jeff, that's an excellent talk and it chimes very well with our B Super Highway initiative, trying to encourage more places for pollinators throughout the borough. There's lots of questions coming, so I'll just go through them if that's OK with you. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely fine. So. Uh, first question is talking about honey and combating hay fever. Um, is that true that local honey can help combat hay fever? If so, where can we find it? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> that's okay. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a pro, I'm a professor of many things, but that's not one of them. I, I mean, I, I have heard that story, um, but I don't know whether um, it's ever been studied medically. Um, so it, it may be true. Uh, it may be a rumour that has been put out by local beekeepers because they want to sell more honey. Mm, um, New Zealand story, wasn't there, about the New Zealand honey not being as as good as people think it is? But, but yeah, the um, manuka honey. Yeah. So, uh, so my uh, my suggestion would be to do a bit of searching for that, to do some googling and, and find some reliable sources. Um, a good place to start actually is Google Scholar. If you do a search on Google Scholar, you'll pick up. Um, any medical studies that have been done on on that topic, um, but I yeah I've no idea whether it's true or not. I'll try and find out. That's okay. Um, and the next question is um, about climate change. As the effect of climate change is being seen, what impact is the increase in flooding having on insect life, including pollinators? Is there anything we can do to combat this? That's and a really good question. That's that's a great question. Um, so, so by and large, um, pollinate. Uh, well, let's let's focus on bees here. Uh, bees like uh, to live in areas that are relatively dry, uh, which don't flood in in winter and don't drown drown the nests. Um, I'm thinking I'm thinking about ground nesting bees here. Um, and the majority of our bees in this country are are ground nesting species. Um, so I think. Uh, certainly on floodplains, um, that that could be an issue for those uh, those bees. Um, but the, but if you think about the kinds of soils that you find on floodplains, they tend to be quite clay soils, uh, which many of our ground nesting bees um, don't like to 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 make the nest in. They per, prefer drier, more more open soils. Um, so so there could be an issue there but but uh, it, i don't think it's the it would be the main issue around uh, with respect to, to climate change um cavity nesting bees those bees that nesting in bee hotels and in naturally into the holes in in trees and, and so on um they're less likely to be affected because they tend to uh make their nests you know at least a meter and a half two meters ab uh, above ground level uh, and as long as the flooding doesn't go above above that then it, it wouldn't be a wouldn't be a problem um for there will be other types of pollinators particularly some of our hoverflies that have larvae uh, which live in in wetter areas or, or even in in wetlands uh, which are likely to benefit from from increased flooding and increased um uh, wide, greater extent of, of wet areas. Um, so, so I, th I think the flooding thing, you know, there'll be species which benefit, there'll be species which don't benefit. Um, I think a, a more, a greater issue, a greater problem is likely to be droughts, extreme droughts um, in the summer, killing off um, or, or allowing, not allowing, you know, our native plants to, to flower. Um, 
and also driving the the uh, the distribution of some of our pollinators further north. Uh, we know that certainly happened with with some of our butterflies, um, and and certainly happened with with some. Uh, several of our bee species. Um, but a lot of these impacts, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning of understanding uh, uh, their, their, their impact. Um, I've got a, a long-term data set that I'm writing up at the moment from the field work that we've done in Tenerife, for example, uh, where we looked at, at interactions between a, a plant, a native plant and its native pollinators uh, over the course of about 15 years. And those 15 years included both the wettest winter uh, that, that Tenerife had experienced and the driest winter. Um, extremes. Uh, ex real extremes, yeah. Most of the rainfall is in, is in the winter. And actually it made no difference whatsoever to the reproductive output of the plant or to the, to the abundance of the, 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 the bees, which were the pollinators. And probably the reason is that you know, a place like Tenerife has gone through these extremes of, of climate for, for a very long time. Uh, and so sensitive species have probably gone extinct there a long time ago, long before human climate change happened. Um, so climate change is certainly an issue, but it's going to be different in different parts of the world. Uh, yeah, I think that's mentioned in a few questions coming up, but I'll, I'll skip to the next question in order. Um, Sarah um, Hawks asks, why don't you consider food production areas, agricultural areas, be part of the urban reach for loss of habitat, since that is presumably why agriculture is primarily needed? Um, it be, because it's a very strict definition of urban, and so urban really is about you know where people live and and where it's built up. Uh, I mean, the, there is no standard definition of what an urban area is. Um, but you know, if if we were to consider agricultural land in Britain to be urbanised uh, by this definition, you know, seventy percent of it is is urbanised. Uh, sorry, 70% is agricultural in Britain. So let's say 10% is urbanised. That's 80% of the of the country. Um, you know, what's the other 20%? Well, nature reserves and and so on. Um, I, it it very much depends on on our definition of, of urban. And I wouldn't consider uh, you know the the Lake District to be urbanised. Uh, even though most of the Lake District is agricultural, um, you know, a lot of it is is um, is used for sheep grazing, for example. Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, yeah, as I think I said in my talk, there's no, you know, the the those urban those agricultural areas are certainly feeding the urban population. Um, but even if the even if our populations were less urban and and they were outside in the agricultural areas, those areas would still be feeding the um, that population. Cool. Uh, um, there's lots of questions, Jeff, so I'll, I'll crack through them. That's all right. No, I'm happy to. They're, they're really interesting, and, and actually, I, I, you know, I, I like questions that make me think about things that I haven't um, considered. Or existed. Um, do you think that the government? This is from Julia. Do you think the government mechanisms like the Environment Bill will help to encourage the recovery of our maintenance of population species? Are they planning to do enough within their 25 years plans? Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit cynical when it comes to this to this government. I, they, they talk a very good game plan. You know, the rhetoric is is there. They're saying all of the right words. And actually, there are members of the government who are, you know, people like Zach Goldsmith, um, and so on, who who are genuine, genuinely have a commitment to the to the environment, um, but I don't trust the the talk to match up with the with the action. You know, I'd love to be wrong. I would absolutely love to be to be wrong, um, but we can see at the moment what the, the way in which um, you know large infrastructure projects, things like HS two. Um, are taking priority um, over um, over you know save, saving habitats and, and, and preserving habitats. We can see that that you know there is a, a a lack of a match between the rhetoric and the and the action. And and the other thing that that really concerns me here, and actually it's something that I, I pick up on in the in the New Scientist article. If if people want to look at that, 
is that really we've got two emergencies going on at the moment. We've got the climate emergency, which a lot of, of local governments, a lot of national governments, international organisations are focused on. But at the same time, we've got the ecological emergency, you know, extinction of species, loss of habitats, um, plastic pollution, all of all of these things. Now, now, the climate emergency and the ecological emergency are not separate. They overlap considerably in in causing you know, over exploitation of, of resources and so on. And they overlap in many of their, their solutions. But quite often the climate emergency takes priority over the ecological emergency. And actually HS2 is a really good example of that because a lot of the arguments around HS2 and why HS2 is something that we should be doing uh, focus on climate change and you know taking traffic off the road, taking freight off, off the road and onto, onto the rail. Um, and that is, that is true, I mean, I mean there, is, there is an argument there, um, but the cost of that is the destruction of you know some nationally and internationally significant sites of, of nature conservation along the route of, of HS2. Um, I'm not a politician. I, I, I'm not the one making the decisions on on this, but it but it does concern me that the the uh, the rhetoric is not being matched by by the actions. Yeah. yeah. Um, a few more questions for you. Um, Leslie asks, has any work been done on the effect of soil temperatures regarding the effect on ground living insects versus tall buildings as we have in London, close to nature reserves and wild flower meadows? So I'm assuming it's talking about the, the heat island effect. Um, no, not that, not that I can recall. Um, it's an interesting question. So, so perhaps what we might expect um, is that warmer soils uh, would allow ground nesting bees to emerge earlier in the season. Uh, that's certainly possible. Um, I'm trying to think back to some. So Musafar uh, Sarohi, who did the uh, the Northampton bee study, he did some work looking at emergence times of uh, this part of his PhD work. Uh, emergence times of bees in uh, the town compared to the uh, the nature reserves, and for some species, certainly they were emerging earlier. We were seeing them earlier in the town compared to the to the nature reserve, but not all of them. Now, whether he I can't remember now whether he um, divided those up into ground nesting versus non ground nesting bees. Um, we tried to publish that a few years ago and it was rejected by the journal we submitted it to. We need to uh, to get back to that, I think, because it, it is an interesting question. Certainly, yeah, there's there's lots of things happening within towns and, and, and cities in relation to changes in microclimate. Thank you. Um I think it's Philippe asked, do you think that green infrastructure is an effective measure to mitigate the negative impacts, both current and future of climate change? Uh, good question, Philip. Philip. If it's the Philip I'm thinking of, he's actually one of my former students. Hello, Philip. Um, he said he was F, Philip that's the one, that's, yeah. that's the same Philip. Um, <laughs> So is, is green infrastructure, I think green infrastructure is really, really important. So, you know, by green infrastructure, we mean the parks and gardens and open green spaces uh, in and around uh, our towns and, and cities. Uh, I think they're really, really important areas. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've seen that during the pandemic, just, you know, how important these sorts of areas have been for people getting out and, and, and exercising and for their mental health and, and so on. Um, and, and we know, I mean, there has been a lot of medical work done on um, on how, you know, just being out in nature in, in the very broadest sense, even, you know, in gardens uh, can improve uh, mental health. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're really, they're really important. Are, are they so important for conservation of biodiversity? Again, I think it comes down to the, the area argument. That our urban areas, strictly speaking, are, are much less than our, um, uh, much smaller than our, than our agricultural areas. Uh, um, uh, but they have a they have a role to play. They, def they definitely have a role to play. 
thank you. Um, I'm pausing because this is a question with lots of long words, so I'm <laughs> going to have to say. Um, and also, just let everyone know that we've got, uh, we'll be asking questions for about eight o'clock, so we've got about 25 minutes more. And apologies if I okay. don't get through your questions. Um, the next question Why aren't pesticides such as thiamine foxum yeah. banned outright, despite evidence such as? Um, Neo nicotinoids. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, you're doing all right, Trevor. It's okay. <laughs> Why aren't they banned out right? Well, um uh, I I think it comes down to one thing, money, actually. Uh that's the sh that's the short answer. There's a huge amount of money tied up in the production the development and the production of um, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and, and so on, uh, from large agricultural uh, or agrochemical companies. Um, and so, um, so a ban, an outright ban on those things uh, would have a big economic impact on those companies. And of course, those companies have got the, the ear of, uh, of government and they can make arguments and lobby uh, around, you know, loss of jobs and lo loss of tax income and, and so on. So that's the, the short reason. I, I think it, it uh, underpinning that question is the idea that uh, governments and individuals always behave logically that um, the that evidence of X will lead to behavioral change Y and that certainly doesn't always always happen um, and I think you know the, the pesticides arguments are really um, a really strong one there um, some of you, some of the people listening here will will know work by um, my friend and colleague Dave Goulson, um, Professor Dave Goulson. Dave and I were, were PhD students together actually, so I've known Dave for a long time, and he's been campaigning and writing about neonicotinoid pesticides for a very very long time, uh, as have have other ecologists, um, and they've come in for a lot of abuse and a lot of um, misrepresentation on social media. Um, and that's coming in part from the agrochemical companies. And actually there's interesting parallels there with what's happened with climate change, that for so long the fossil fuel industry denied that climate change was going to be a problem, was a problem, even though they knew it was, it was a, a, a problem. Um, and they are, you know, uh, misrepresenting scientists who are speaking out about this. Um, that's a long answer to a, to a simple question, but I think it just comes down to the economics of it. Oh, indeed. Um, Chloe asks, what do you think would be the most progressive and effective method of trying to slow the decline of bee population in Britain? Uh, creation of habitat. Creation of habitat and um, uh, mainly grassland habitat. You know, we've got the statistic of some 90 or 97 percent of our wild flare meadows have been lost uh, uh, over the last 50 years or so. So creation of more of, of that kind of habitat. But it, it requires more than just flowers. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the book um, is the fact that that pollinators need more than flowers. They need, you know, sometimes nesting sites or in the case of butterflies and moths, you know, the caterpillars need specific host plants. Uh, they might also require other kinds of resources. So leaf cutting bees, for example, um, need need leaves of appropriate leaves to, to cut discs out of that they can then line their nests with. Um, so it's it's about creation of habitat more 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 broadly. Um, yeah, we need we need more habitat. That's the the one thing. And kind of related to that in habitats in urban areas, um, Julia asked, should soil health in urban in environments be considered? Uh, quite possibly, yes. I mean, it's, again, it's one of the things we don't we don't know about. Um, so so when I spoke about um, University of Northampton's water site campus, I talked about remediation of the site. Um, 
part of the site had been used as um, as a power station for the town up until the 1970s. Uh, another part of the site had been used as a um, as a tannery historically. Um, so there was a lot of um, uh, pollution within the soils there. So those those the level of those soils had to be built up and and uh, and capped off uh, to remediate the remediate the site. Um, what we don't know is whether any of the ground nesting bees could be suffering from you know, heavy metal pollution or, or, or whatever on, on those sites. Um, it, again, it's, some, it's something that's, that's rarely been considered, rarely been, been studied. That's a good uh, question. I, I'm just scanning the questions and there's some um, confirmation that we um, people are saying that perhaps um, local honey doesn't help hay fever. So that's good, yeah. to, good to know. Um, I'm just scanning through. Um, there's a question here relating to the bee superhighway, which I might um, skip to if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. Which is asking what five actions could local authorities in urban areas take to encourage um, well, actually, top three actions for local authorities to take to promote pollinators. Top three for take advantage of biodiversity net gain in practice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to, to, top three things they could do. One is to stop mowing every bit of urban grassland to within an inch of its life. Uh, you know, let some of these areas flower. Um, there's been this big sort of craze recently to uh, create wild flower meadows um, in on urban sites, particularly in, in urban parks. Um, and I've been asked to advise on on some of these in Northampton and, and elsewhere. And one of the things I always say is, before you start to do any work, before you start, you know, taking off turf and and planting uh, wildflower seeds and so on consider what is there already um you know it's, it's going back to the old kind of medical adage of first do no harm because quite often our, our urban parks have got a surprising diversity of of plants there already um which which are just being suppressed by by the mowing um and so if we reduce the the frequency of mowing maybe only do it once or twice a year um, or maybe even once every two years, um, allow those those two uh, areas to flower um, and, and just see what that what that attracts in. Um, you know, creating wildflower meadows is a lot of work. It's expensive and it needs a lot of maintenance as well. So actually just reducing the amount of mowing in these areas would, would be would be one thing. Um, second thing would be to stop spraying patches of, of weeds, so-called weeds, uh, with glyphosate. Um, uh, this drives me bonkers. I, I see it all over the town. These patches of yellow dying plants that are popping up from pavements and, and so on. I mean, yeah, there, there, are, there are places where you, you need to remove uh, plants because they could be damaging um, pavements or damaging walls and, and, and so on. But most of them are fairly benign. Just, just, um, just let them be. And then the third thing would be to have um, awareness campaigns, educational campaigns to explain to the general public why that's being done, why those weeds are being left, why we're not um, mowing parks and, and, um, and, and grass verges and so on, to just make it clear to people that it's not about um, you know, being lazy and not about saving money, it's actually about conserving biodiversity. Um, and um, once people understand that, they start they start to get it. Uh, and and so, the, so the flip side of it is that, you know, for, for the general public needs to learn to embrace messiness a little bit. We, you know, we need to, to start to love our weeds in, in towns and cities. Cool. That's two. Have you got one more to make the three, Jeff? <laughs> oh, no, no, that was no, that was three. That was, so oh, that right. was yeah, no, no, that was three. That was you know, reduce the mowing, stop reduce using the, the pesticides, and the third thing was to have the the awareness campaign. I beg your pardon. Sorry, yes, yep. I, was, yep. I was scanning. I lost count there. No, 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 that was me. So I apologize. <laughs> so I was just scanning questions. See if I could um, um, summarize them for you. Um, there's questions talking around. Um, Something I was going to ask you, um, for, for a botany expert, the 
where you mentioned um, urban plants and na uh, non-native species. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to find the question. So do you think that non-native flowering species are important in conserving bees in urban areas, even with the potential environmental impacts to native species? Um, yeah, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, most non-native plant species are fairly neutral in their overall environmental effect. Um, they, um, they're not invasive. You know, the, 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 the proportion of non-native species that become invasive and, and do actually have a, um, a, a wider environment, negative environmental impact um, is relatively small, you know, compared to the, the number of plants that are planted in gardens and, and so on. Um, so by and large, I, I, I think they're, I think it, they're fine. Um, if, you know, if it comes down to planting schemes in, in parks and gardens and nature reserves and, and so on, uh, yes, I, I prefer to see native species. Um, but quite often there's, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what constitutes a native species in, in Britain. Um, so, you know, some of the people listening may know, but I suspect many will not know, that none of our poppies are native. Um, those poppies were introduced uh, probably by the Romans, perhaps even a little bit earlier from, from Southeast Europe and, and the Eastern Mediterranean. That's where they're actually native to. So, you know, these iconic poppies in, in cornfields uh, that, that were, we see as being part of the British landscape, that's, they're non-native. Um, probably quite, you know, quite a lot of, of what is we consider to be native, uh, what we term archaeophytes, they've been here, plants that have been here a long time, have sort of appeared in the archaeological record. Um, so I'm probably a little bit more relaxed than, than most people, um, certainly when it comes to towns and cities. Um, I think there's, there's a place for non-native species. Um, but when it comes to yeah, more, more sensitive areas, nature reserves and so on, yeah, we probably don't want them there. OK, so I'll, if everyone's OK, I'll ask questions for another 15 minutes or so. I will stop skipping questions and do them more chronologically because I'm missing some out there. Okay. So um, do, 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 do you think Northflower? The next question is asking, hi, Jeff. Um, this is from um, Shimon Ali. Um, climate change may increase introduction of new species of pollinators, but does this add to the native species tally? Um, hello, Shanom. Another one of uh, my former students. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I, I, I strongly suspect that Julia from earlier on was one of my former, former students as, as well. But um, yeah. Uh, so, is climate change having a positive impact on pollinators in terms of us receiving new pollinators? I think that's the question that's been asked. So, um, so the answer is almost certainly yes. So, since two thousand. Uh, we've added something like, um, I ought to know this figure because it's in the book, um, it's somewhere between 10 and 15 new species of bees uh, and flower visiting wasps and hoverflies and so on uh, to, the, to the British list, to the native list. Now some of those are clearly non-native, so things like the Asian hornet, uh, which is, has appeared in the last, in the last few years, uh, which is from Asia originally, and you know that was transported into, into mainland Europe and is now has now arrived in Britain. Um, so those are clearly non-native. But things like tree bumblebees, uh, which um, many people will be familiar with now in in from gardens across towns and cities, it does have a particular preference for urban areas. Uh, things like tree bumblebee, things like the ivy bee as well, um, seem to have got over here under their own steam uh, and they're actually part of range expansions by by these species uh, which are which are naturally occurring now some of that probably is due to to climate change um, and certainly we're starting to see moths turn up in in britain which are more often associated with uh, with warmer environments further south in in Europe, uh, but not all of it. Not, not it's not all to do with with climate change. Um, 
this is one of the things that species do that you know species are not fixed in their distribution uh they move they 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 expand their ranges they contract their ranges uh regardless of what of what humans do um but it certainly seems to have increased since since the year 2000 so over the last two decades it seems to have increased uh and i, I think some of that can be attributed to climate change yeah Cool. Um, there's a question here. Have you noticed areas within urban environments that are more important slash significant for pollinators, e.g. urban parks versus private gardens versus road verges? Um, <clears throat> the areas that seem to be the most important um, are areas that have been stable over over a fairly long period of of time um so you know bits of grassland for example that have been grassland for for many many decades they kind of accumulate species over time um one of the pictures that i showed earlier on which was um of of uh, an area which which looks as if it was you know chock full of, of weeds alongside a um a, a metal fence those sorts of areas seem to be uh, particularly good for ground nesting bees uh, for two reasons one is you know there's lots of plants there that they can take nectar and pollen from um, but also um, the the soils in those areas tend to be very very dry and again you know that's for many of our uh, ground nesting bees that's the sort of environment that they that they prefer um, gardens can be very good or they can be very poor it depends what's in what's in the garden um, this current trend for having plastic grass, for example, and lots of plastic plants, um, oh, I just despair of that. It's just just awful. Um, above and beyond the fact it's it's ugly. I mean, it provides no resources for pollinators, um, and the little bits of microplastics break off and get into the uh, into the the sewage system and into the rivers and so on. Um, and um, yeah, cause environmental problems. Um, so actually that would be a fourth thing that I would ask councils to do, ban plastic grass plates. Mm, yeah, I agree. It's a very odd trend at the moment. Yeah. Um, there's questions and people are answering, so thank you to contributions in the chat as well, uh, about the value of um, roof gardens um, mm. for, for pollinators. Can pollinators reach them in terms of flying height? And a question talking about how can you improve um, green and brown roofs? How can they be improved for pollinators? Mm. OK, um, I've, I've heard this this kind of asked, you know, a number of times by people, you know, are roof gardens too high? Um, how can the pollinators possibly get up there? But, you know, with roof gardens, we're, we're talking typically, think, you know, things that are sort of tens to hundreds of feet above the ground surface. Um, pollinators very, very happily fly up to the tops of hills and mountains in, in Britain that are thousands of feet high. Uh, OK, the, you know, the topography is, is different, but it's, you know, it's still um, a considerable height. Um, so pollinators have absolutely no problem at all getting up to roof gardens even on the top of some of um, some of the highest buildings in, in and around um, our towns and cities. Um, uh, Mark, oh, I can't remember his surname. Uh, he has a Mark, he has a company called Apicultural, API Cultural, uh, which deals with uh, things like roof gardens and uh, urban beekeeping and and so on. If you would, if you do, if people Google the name Apicultural, uh, they'll they'll find him. But he works specifically in and around London, um, and he's created some very very high uh, roof gardens in London. Uh, Dusty Gage as well has also worked uh, a lot with um, with green roofs in London. He's created some some great roof gardens uh, and they attract um, pollinators and birds as well, of course, um, even on the highest uh, roof gardens in, in the city. Um, what can, can people do to improve uh, habitat? 
Uh, well, again, it's going back to this. So one thing, you know, going back to this idea that uh, most of our uh, uh, bees in, in Britain are ground nesting bees. They need a considerable distance of, of, of depth of soil into which to um, uh, to make their nests. Now, for most roof gardens, it's not possible to have you know a meter of soil uh, on there. The, the, the structurally, those those roofs just won't take that weight. But it is possible to have little mounds of of soil dotted around the place that are deep enough for um, for those bees uh, to nest. Uh, so that and, and again, if you go to the apicultural site, there's some great photographs on there showing what Mark has, has been doing um, in, with respect to, to creating those sorts of habitats on on roofs. And it's been really successful. Cool, great. I'm just conscious that it's now five to eight, so I might just um, wrap it up two final questions. And um, um, Jeff, um, if anyone's got questions, like you said, they're very welcome to either feed them through Ecology or or write to you through your website with any yeah. questions. Yeah, there's a, there's a contact page on the website. People can send me questions or comments. Because I do apologise if people have got lots of questions, but we it, it just feels um, that it may be time. But eight o'clock seems a good time to stop. Um, a question that um, Gerardo, um, do you know him? Um, <laughs> I think I do. If it's Gerardo Camillo from, from the USA, then, yeah, then yes, I do know who it is. <laughs> um, do you have a sense of what proportion of bees are specialists? Um, and he raises the point, for most vertebrate groups, generalists rule the cities, uh, while specialists are generally ap essentially absent. Uh, yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, I, I, again, it comes down to resources, doesn't it? You know, it, it depends what what those bees are specialised on. Um, I think Gerard is specifically thinking about pollen um, pollen specialisms. Uh, so some of our bees are are generalists. They're, they're what are termed polylectic. They'll take pollen from a wide range of of sources. Um, a wide range of different plants. Uh, others are what we term monolectic. They'll only take pollen from um, a particular um, species of, of plant or a particular genus of, of plants or sometimes a, a particular family. Um, so there's a range of different specialisms there. So it very much depends on whether or not those plants are, are available in, in our towns and cities. Um, one of the things that we do know is that specialist pollinators um, tend to specialize on relatively common plants. Um, it's unusual for pollinators, for, for specialist pollinators to specialize on rare and specialist plants um, because, you know, clearly from, a, from a, an extinction risk point of view, uh, a, a bee that specialises on a specialist is itself likely to to uh, to go extinct. You're doubling your chances of going extinct, really. Um, so very much, yeah. It, it depends on whether those specialist species are are there. Um, but there is, I, I have seen some work suggesting that generalists tend to be more common in um, in urban areas. Um, that's probably true, particularly in the larger urban areas. Um, Northampton is, a, it, going back to that case, too, Northampton is unusual in that, you know, it's a relatively small town uh, and it has strong connections to the wider agricultural uh, and, and, and rural land around it. So it may be unusual in that, in that respect, but we'd certainly had some specialist species in, in Musafar's uh, collections. Cool, thank you. And, um Last question um, before a uh, formal thank you again is Cynthia, um, relating back to RBKC. Um, we've got a big house building project program, sorry, starting this year. As residents, what should we should be asking the council so we can make the best, they're getting the best advice to ensure biodiversity is considered and optimised. What sort of experts should we be insisting or asking the council to engage with? Uh, you should be asking the council to engage with ex experts on pollination and pollinators, such as myself. <laughs> is one answer. <laughs> and it actually, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, slightly. You know, sorry, I was slightly flippant, but but uh, seriously, um, I've been running some uh, training, some online training courses for um, for ecological consultancies, 
Um, and what's interesting uh, from from talking to uh, consultant ecologists is that they're very you're often very very expert, very very focused on um, species which they have to uh, deal with uh, for for legal reasons. So things like bats, things like great crested newts, uh, things like nesting birds, uh, and so on. They know an awful lot about those, and they know an awful. They, they can advise very very um, uh, well on on how to mitigate um, against. Uh, destruction of, of habitats that include those kinds of species and they do translocation of reptiles and amphibians and, and so on. Um, there's much less understanding of uh, things like insect pollinators um, and, and how habitats can be created and how they can be conserved um, and I think that comes down to the fact that you know, none of our um, in, insects in, in Britain really have um, legal protection, not certainly not legal protection in the same way that um, bats or, or reptiles and amphibians or badgers have have legal protection. Um, uh, so I think it's it's about you know if if councils are really serious about um, having um, habitat within towns and cities that is supporting pollinators, uh, they really need to talk to to, to people who who know about pollinators and know uh, about how to to create and maintain habitat that will will support those pollinators and I'm, I'm not the only one you know there are there are plenty of other people out there who who know just as much as me about about pollinators no, that's great. Um, like I say, Jeff, um, as you can see, there's lots of questions that we could go on a bit longer, but I think perhaps we should wrap it up now. Um, so thank you very much again for all your um, advice and your talk this evening. And in the chat, uh, you'll see afterwards, there's a lot of um, nice comments, including someone from Mexico has dialed in as well. So lots of people enjoyed that. Um, a copy or recording of this will be made available a few days later through the library service. Up next in the Ecology Service programme for the B Super Highway, we've got um, Nikki Gammons from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust talking about the importance of bumblebees. And then the week after, a lady called Erica McAllister from the yeah. Natural History Museum talking about the importance of flies as pollinators and full details of those are on our website. Mm. So again, thank you very much to Jeff and my colleagues in the Library Service and I wish everyone a very good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You're most welcome, Trevor. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeff, again. Thank you. Take care. Bye.